Hey, it's Art from My New Microphone. I recently surpassed the coveted 1,000 subscriber mark here on YouTube, and so I would like to start this video by thanking each and every one of you who subscribed to the channel. I published my first video about a year ago, and so the channel's still very young, still very small. I would like to, again, thank each and every one of you for supporting the channel. If you're brand new here, I talk about mixing and music production, primarily in small home studios and bedroom studios. So if that is something that interests you, I would encourage you to check out this video and a few others. If you like what you see to please subscribe here for more content. With that out of the way, let's get to the bulk of this video and talk about loudness in our mixing. We often strive for loud mixes to make our songs sound more powerful and also to compete with commercially released music. However, our efforts often fall flat on both fronts. As we try to push things louder, we often kill the dynamics and the transients of our mixes, making them sound dull and lifeless. And then at the end of it all, they aren't even as loud technically and perceptibly as the music that we are referencing. If you've ever looked up how to get louder mixes before, you've likely come across a video or an article explaining how to use limiting on either the mix bus or the master bus, where in the last part of the signal chain, we will use a limiter to add gain to the signal and then limit it so that it's not clipping and call it a day. And while this is an effective strategy that we will discuss in this video briefly, there are a few other things we can do within the mix itself to maximize the potential for loudness so that when it comes to loudness maximization, we can take advantage and get a louder mix when all is said and done. Before we hop into the digital audio workstation where I will share each of the techniques I have to share with you today for louder mixes, I briefly want to go over the science of loudness. Acoustics and psychoacoustics can be very difficult to understand, but I want to lay a foundation so that we can better understand what we are doing and how we are getting loudness within our mix. So the first question to ask is what is loudness? Loudness in acoustics and psychoacoustics refers to the relative perception of sound pressure and sound pressure level. It's really all about the relative levels of sound pressure. In order to have something that is loud, we need something that is quiet. In order to have something that is quiet, we need something to be loud. When I teach mixing and music production, I like to talk a lot about contrast, and this is one of the key points that we need to keep in mind as we think about loudness in the mix, is the contrast. In order to have something that is loud, we need something that is quiet. In order to have something that is quiet, we need something loud. Naturally, we have the threshold of human hearing, where anything above the threshold is perceptible, anything below is imperceptible. Scientifically, we set this point at zero dB SPL, or zero decibels sound pressure level, which means that a one kilohertz tone will just be perceptible at zero dB SPL, and anything below that we will not be able to hear, and anything above that we will be able to hear. As we increase in dB SPL, things will become louder, and as we decrease dB SPL, things will become quieter. Decibels are logarithmic and tie into how we perceive variances in sound pressure level. They are rather complex and I don't have time to explain them in this video, but I do have an article going into detail about that. I will leave a link to that in the description box down below if you're interested in learning more. I should also mention here that the universally accepted range of human hearing spans from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. These are the frequencies that we can hear. However, the frequency response of our auditory system is anything but linear. We are more sensitive to the mid-range, particularly around 4K, and we are much less sensitive to the extremes, the extreme low end and the extreme high end. As we age and our ears change and become damaged, we lose more and more of the high end and the very low end, although we can hear at certain levels, is more so felt than it is heard. What's more is that as the sound pressure level increases, the frequency response of our auditory system actually flattens out, making the extreme high end and low end more easily heard relative to the mid range. And on top of that, each and every one of us perceives sound differently, making the study of psychoacoustics and acoustics extremely difficult to pinpoint down. But the two main simple points I want us to take away is that one, we are more sensitive to the mid range than we are to the extreme low and extreme high, and two, loudness is relative. So we can't have something loud without something quiet. Now when it comes to mixing, things are a little bit different. During playback, if we want something louder, we can simply turn the volume up. If we want something quieter, we can simply turn the volume down. And so when it comes to getting louder mixes, we have to turn to the actual audio itself. Holistically, we can compare our own mix downs against other mix downs and masters. Louder mixes will have higher average signal levels. This can be measured in RMS, LKFS, LUFS, or other methods. Also, when it comes to audio, we have maximum peak levels for our audio signals. These can be hard ceilings in digital audio and softer ceilings in analog audio, but they are still there. So in order to get louder mixes, meaning higher average signal levels, we have to effectively decrease the dynamic range 
of that audio. We have a maximum ceiling, we need a higher average signal level, and therefore the dynamic range, the differences between the peaks and the troughs of the audio signal have to be reduced in order to get a louder mix. There have been many casualties of the loudness war over the years where in an effort to get things louder than the competition, we've sacrificed dynamics leading to dull and often distorted mixes and masters as a result. The heart of the issue is that music needs dynamics in order to sound interesting and musical, while loudness needs higher average levels. These things are often at odds with each other, and we have to kind of split the difference and compromise in order to get a loud mix that is also a nice dynamic and musical mix. Now before we get into each of these strategies, it's important to ask ourselves whether loudness is something worth striving for or not in any specific mix. Of course, it's important to understand how to get loud mixes, that's why I put this video together, but it's also important to understand when we need loud mixes and how far we should be pushing things to compromise the dynamics for loudness within our mixes and our masters. So with all of that said, let's now hop into the Digital Audio Workstation and I will show you a few techniques I like to use to get louder mixes within the mix. Let's go. All right, the first technique I have to share with you for louder mixes is actually in the arrangement itself. So generally speaking, denser mixes are more difficult to make loud than sparser mixes, and also songs with greater dynamics, both in the long term and the short term, are generally more difficult to make as loud as songs that don't have as many dynamics. Long term dynamics refers to the differences in overall loudness between different sections of the song. Remember, we can only push the loudest parts so loud, and so if there's a lot of variation between the different sections of the songs, think classical music for example, then it's more difficult to get the quieter sections to be as loud as perhaps the quieter sections in a pop song where the variation between the different sections in terms of overall loudness are not quite as disparate. In terms of short-term dynamics, I'm talking about the transients, which often come as a result of percussion and drums. These short peaks in the audio are often the first to suffer as we are pushing our mix or our master into limiting. And so in songs that have a lot of transient information, a lot of short-term dynamics, it can be more difficult to push those as loud as more ambient or less percussive mixes without suffering as much distortion or dulling of those transients. So if we look at the screen right here, you'll see that I have two limiters. We may be getting ahead of ourselves. I am going to talk more about limiters shortly, but basically what I want to show you is the first mix right here is just a solo guitar. There's no percussive instruments in this one. And then this mix down here is basically a full band with drums, with bass, and a whole bunch of other instruments. So these are two songs off of my record, Memes and Dreams. I'll leave a link to that in the description box down below. But for this exercise, I'm just going to use the Pro L to my go-to limiter from FabFilter, and I'm just going to use the stock settings and push the gain up on each of these to see how loud we can get each of them without suffering a significant amount of distortion. And then we can hear and see how much louder we can get a relatively sparse mix versus a denser mix here. So let's push first right of Asylum. <laughs> Getting distortion there. So that's about as comfortable as I would be pushing it. Maybe a little less. And now the next one, let's get that same about 3 dB of limiting. Now we'll A, B them. Listen to how much louder the guitar sounds in this one versus this mix right here. So if I was to have both of these songs back to back on the album, the differences in the guitar would sound perhaps a little bit uncanny. And actually in this album, I have 
the LUFS for Rite of Asylum actually lower than the others, just so that the guitar isn't overly loud compared to all of the other mixes. And you can see here that technically speaking, the integrated luffs are higher on Rite of Asylum versus To the Moon and Back. A difference right here of 1.9 LUFS, which is a pretty good meter of the overall perceived loudness of a track. So if you are producing music yourself or you're involved in the actual production phase of songs that you're mixing, take this into account and focus a little bit on the arrangement, remembering that denser mixes are often more difficult to get as loud, as clean, as less dense mixes, that songs with greater dynamic range are often more difficult to get as loud as songs with less dynamic range to begin with. And as a third note, songs with a lot of low end energy in the arrangement are often more difficult to get as loud because the low end takes up more energy than say the mid range or the upper range. And that brings me to the next point worth discussing, and that is using EQ to make things sound louder in the mix. So to understand how EQ can help us get louder mixes, we should turn to the equal loudest contours. You can see them up on the screen right here. I will leave a link to the appropriate source where I got this image. And basically what we see here are the frequencies along the X axis. You can see these lines span from about 20 Hertz to 20,000 Hertz. This is the audible range of human hearing. And then on the Y axis, we see sound pressure level DB SPL. And so the zero line right here is considered the threshold of human hearing. And you can see that that is true at around 1000 Hertz, but it's actually the case that according to this graph, at least we can hear negative dB SPL levels in the 2K to about 5K range here. And so these red lines right here are represented by Fawn. This is a measurement of perceived loudness or how we perceive the loudness of certain frequencies to be. And so you can see that by these lines, it takes a lot more sound pressure level at very low frequencies in order for us to hear them and less sound pressure level in the mid range for us to hear those frequencies at the same perceived level. And then you can see here as well that we are less sensitive to the high end as well. One interesting thing to point out about this graph is that things tend to flatten out a little bit more as we get higher and higher in the sound pressure level. But the key part to take away here is that we have a situation where the low end frequencies, the long wavelengths of low end frequencies take up a lot of energy in the mix and we need a lot of them in order to actually hear them in the mix. And because they take up so much energy, they eat up so much headroom in the mix. And so if we can actually get rid of a lot of these frequencies, we can push things up a little bit louder before hitting that ceiling, whether we are clipping or limiting to get the maximum loudness in our signals. By the same token, because we are so sensitive to these mid-range frequencies right here, if we were to boost those mid-range frequencies either in the arrangement or in the levels, the faders of our mixes, if we push elements that are really well represented in this range, or of course we can utilize EQ to actually boost certain elements of the mix in this range and thereby get a louder mix as a result. So I sometimes talk about the importance of high pass filtering. And while this is super important to get a nice clean low end with less phase cancellation and less noise and rumble in the low end, it's also important for getting more loudness out of the mix because again, there's gonna be less energy in this range right here, which we are not very sensitive to making more relative energy in the mid range. And because we're more sensitive to the mid range than the low end, we can actually make a mix sound louder as a result. So I hope that that all makes sense to you as a way to prove this. Let's go back to this mix right here that has quite a bit of low end. I'll actually exit out of the right of asylum limiter. Let's move that limiter down and open up another fab filter plugin. This time it's going to be the Pro Q3 and I will double click to create a band here and I will make it a low cut or high shelf filter right here. And what I'm going to do is roll off some of that low end and see how much louder we can get this mix. I'm going to note right now that this is just for demonstration purposes. I'm not saying that this is what I would actually do in the mix. I'm going to be cutting out quite a significant amount of low end. It's still very important to have low end in the mix, but I just wanna show you in an obvious fashion how we can get louder mixes if we were to get rid of some of the extreme lows and in some cases the extreme highs. So let's get things started here. Let's roll that up. So we're peaking quite a bit here but we don't hear it as significant distortion versus if I took this off.
if I take this EQ off. The Pro L2 limiting doesn't sound all that good. Let me just run this through. We're taking out a lot here. It's sounding pretty distorted. Here it does, it sounds thin, but it doesn't sound overly bad and distorted from the limiting. And so it's tough to actually A, B compare this because I am cutting out a lot of the low end frequency, so it's gonna sound quite a bit different. But it was my hope to show you there that when I do have this high cut, we're still getting a significant amount of limiting on the snares in particular, but it doesn't sound overly distorted. And then when I bring in the low end energy there, we're obviously getting more limiting, more distortion, Perhaps it isn't the best way to demonstrate this, but it is a quick way to do so, and I hope that that all makes sense. Once again, we are less sensitive to the very low end and the very high end, and so reducing those frequencies in the mix and focusing more on the mid-range can actually get us more potential loudness out of our mixes. One primary way of doing this is with EQ, although we can also make it happen with the actual arrangement of the song and with the actual mixing with the faders of individual elements that are more or less represented in certain frequency ranges. I'm splitting this video up into eight tips because it's a nice number to have. However, a lot of the tips kind of bleed together. Mixing is a very holistic practice, and so there's a lot of stuff that goes into getting potential loudness. And there is, of course, some blurring of the lines when it comes to that. One last thing I want to mention about EQ and loudness in the mix is that we can actually automate EQ to make certain sections of the song sound bigger than others. We can do this by either band passing sections that we want to sound a little bit smaller and then taking that band pass filtering off to allow more low end and more high end to pass through the mix in sections that we want to sound bigger. And at the same time, we can also boost a little bit in that mid range we are more sensitive to if we want certain sections to stand out a little bit more in the mix. It's important to note that while having a lot of long-term dynamics and variation between the levels throughout different sections of the song can reduce the overall integrated LUFS that we might otherwise have, but it's still a super important part for adding contrast to the song itself and making certain sections sound loud and other sections to sound quiet. Which is important if we remember the intro of this video, we need to always keep in mind that listeners can simply turn things up if they want it to be louder, and so dynamics are also an important part of that. All right, let's move on to tip number three for louder mixes. All right, tip number three for getting your mixes louder is of course everybody's favorite, compression. Now compression, particularly downward compression as we will typically talk about when discussing compression, is a process that reduces the dynamic range or compresses the dynamic range, hence the name. And it does so by reacting to the peaks of an audio signal or any audio that is above a set threshold set within the compressor. And by bringing down those peak levels, we can effectively raise the entirety of the audio signal to increase the average level while while still maintaining that same peak level, and that is done with makeup gain primarily. And so compression is a lot more than that. There are also attack and release controls. We can actually use compression to help shape transients and make things even more dynamic if we want to. I actually have a video on that. I will leave that link in the description box down below. But as I stated in the intro, a lot of the loudness that we achieve comes from reducing the dynamic range, and compression is the process to reduce or compress the dynamic range. And so to demonstrate this, I want to show you the drum bus on one of my songs. This is the reservation off of an upcoming album, Fine Dining with an Octopus. And if we scroll down here, we have the drum subgroup soloed, and I have the trusty SSL comp. This is the Waves emulation of a Solid State Logic G Master bus compressor. And what I want to focus on here, if I bring this mixer up, is utilizing the SSL comp right here to of course compress the drums and I'm going to use the makeup gain so that when I toggle this on and off to AB test we are at the same perceived level and then I want to look at the peak level right here to understand how much peak headroom we have in this signal. So the more headroom we have the greater the potential for loudness of in this case the drum subgroup. And so let's have a listen. I will play a section and then I will adjust this and AB test it so that we are comparing signals of equal perceived perceived level. Remember, the focus here is on the perceived level, not on the actual peak level right here. The compressor's on. Getting about 4 dB of gain reduction on the kick and snare. Actually turn the makeup gain up a little bit. a 
little more compression. And I'm focusing on that snare and the kick, which are actually causing the compressor to act. So with 2 dB of makeup gain, it sounds pretty much the same to me in terms of perceived loudness. Of course, this compressor is going to help glue together the sound of the drums. I have videos on glue as well. I will leave those in the description box as well. But the main point here is that I have this audio sounding the same perceived loudness, whether this compressor is on or off. And now what I want to do is have a look just in this short section, what the peak level of the subgroup is going to be without the compressor and then we're gonna test it with the compressor on. So without. So we have a peak level of negative 6.7, and I actually realized that the attack is quite slow, and so there's gonna be some transient information that comes through. So this is going to be an interesting experiment right here. We may actually get greater peak levels because the compressor is going to take a long time to actually engage and compress the signal because the attack is so slow. So let's actually have a listen and a look and see what the new peak value is. I will turn this on. So we're actually peaking quite a bit more. Now, what if I took this attack all the way down 0.1 milliseconds? See, we're getting a lot more compression first off. Now that we have a very fast attack, let's rerun that experiment. Without it, I think the peak was right here. So negative 6.6 .6 there, and then with compression. And so that goes to show you how much transient shaping we can actually do with attack and release controls. Here we have about 4 dB more headroom when the compressor is fast acting. Again, it's going to clamp down on those transients very quickly versus letting the transients pass through. And so it sounds like it kind of kills the transients a little bit, but this is more so for demonstration purposes. And I'm happy that I actually had that little mishap with the attack very slow, just to show you the power of compression and how we can use it to actually shape the transients. And then if I was to use this on a less transient signal, let's take the piano, for example. This special piano right here, if we find it in the arrange view, happens to be right here. So that's what this sounds like. So it's got some weird effects going on it. Now, if I was to slap a compressor, I'll just use the classic compressor from Logic, the stock one. I'm going to turn off auto gain and let's do the same thing here. I'm going to make the attack very slow and I'll leave the release at a few milliseconds right here. Let's turn up the ratio and basically set this so that we are A being at a similar level or the same perceived level. And then we can test our headroom over here. Maybe bring that attack down a little bit to make it sound not as strange. So with the compressor on, we are peaking at negative 23.2. peaking at negative 22.5. So it actually sounds a bit louder with this and we're actually getting more headroom out of it. And so that is one way to get a little bit more loudness. Of course, we are going to mess with the dynamics and using too much compression can often suck the life out of a mix. So we do have to be careful even if we're using it on individual elements or subgroups within the mix and not solely on the mix bus. 
We also have to be aware of the glue versus separation in the mix. Utilizing compression can help to glue things together and make them sound more cohesive. However, it often does so at the expense of separation within the mix. And so these are all things we need to take into account when utilizing compression in order to get a louder mix. So that was a general look at compression and in particular downward compression. The next tip I have for you is actually upward compression, which is most commonly achieved via parallel compression. And so parallel compression, let's go back to the drums over here. And if I go to the mixer, you can see here that my drum shells, that is the kick and the snare in this case, there are no toms in this mix, are all being routed to bus 11. And then if I scroll over here in the mixer, I can see that bus 11 comes in over here on the drum parallel compression bus. And if I scroll up, I have that same SSL comp right here. I actually put a decapitator on here. This is a Sound Toys saturation plugin. I can turn this off for the demonstration purposes here. And I also have a channel EQ, just the stock EQ from Logic, but it's not actually doing anything. So I'll turn that off as well. So this channel, which is being fed by bus 11, which is ultimately being fed by the kick drum and the snare drum has a compressor on it. So what I'm doing with parallel compression is I'm sending those dry tracks over here, the kick and snare, largely uncompressed, although I do have a bit of compression on them to begin with, but these are relatively uncompressed signals being fed to bus 11. And then again, bus 11 is coming in over here on this parallel drum bus, which is being slammed with compression and then mixed in underneath those original tracks. And what this does is it actually acts as a form of upward compression, where rather than once these two are mixed together, cutting down on the peaks of the mixed together signals, we're actually raising up the lower level of the mixed together signals. So I hope that that's making sense. The actual parallel compression bus here is acting with downward compression. So the audio being compressed on this bus that is then being mixed underneath is actually being compressed with downward compression. So we're taking the peaks and dropping them down. However, when we then mix that underneath the dry tracks, those peaks don't add as much signal as the lower level information coming out of this effects return. And so the parallel compression audio coming out of this parallel compression channel is feeding more signal level at the low and average levels of the drums and less at the peak levels. So if we mute this, we can have a listen without the parallel compression and then with the parallel compression. And what I'm going to do is solo the drums, all of them right here. In Logic, I need to actually solo the individual elements in order for the sends to work. And we're gonna have a listen again with and without this parallel compression bus. And then I will bring this up and down to really give you guys an idea. And I'll keep this compressor open right here. You're gonna see that we're really slamming this with some gain reduction here. And then we can keep an eye on the mix bus level right here. negative 10. I'll bring in the parallel compression. So it just thickens up the kick and the snare here. It sounds almost thin now that we take it away. And so it does increase the overall peak level because again, we are adding signal to the original drums with this parallel channel right here, but we're not adding as much to the very peaks as we are to the underneath, so to speak, of the audio signal. And this can be seen even more if I bring down this attack once again, I'll bring that down to the fastest amount. And then we can have another listen here. That's with it on. If I mute it. I'm just completely destroying it right here. It just helps to thicken it up a little bit and it's really not adding all that much signal level right here because we're crushing it so much over here. 
So I hope that that makes sense. It is a slight difference. We are still compressing or restricting that dynamic range. In the first instance or tip three, we were acting with downward compression where we're taking the peak level and bringing it down and then moving everything up. And in the second instance here or tip number four, we're actually keeping the peak level or raising it just a little bit and then raising up the average level even more right there. And so again, they are very similar. They are both styles of compression, but I wanted to show you them separately as different tips. And on that point, we actually have a cool effect that we can utilize. If I go back to the drum subgroup right here. For you Ableton users, I'm sure that you are well aware of this effect, but if we go down for all of us non-Ableton users to X for Records, there's a free plugin called OTT. And this is a setting inside Ableton, which has been recreated by Extra Records here. This is a multi-band up and down compressor. So we have three bands, a high, a mid, and a low. And basically what this plugin does is it offers us downward compression and upward compression. And it's a great way to bring out the low level detail of sounds with the upward compression, while also being able to crush the overall sound of the audio running through it with the downward compression. And in the case of the OTT, the lows and the highs are compressed more than the mids, and that helps to thicken things up and bring out detail while still allowing the signal to breathe a little bit in the important mid-range. And so just fresh out of the box on the drums, it sounds like this. So it's obviously very crushed, but you can hear a lot of that detail come out in the drums. And so it's not something that I would necessarily use on drums, but I just wanted to show you this in this video. And if I quickly A-B tested this and paid attention to get the same peak level, I wonder what we would get here. negative 10.5. So it sounds a lot more massive, a lot more crushed, not necessarily something I would go for, but the peak level, the difference there is only about a dB at the very peaks, but you heard there how much bigger, crushed and fatter the OTT sound was versus not having the OTT on, on the drum bus in this example. The fifth tip I have for you is another one to do with compression. This is utilizing serial compression. And so serial compression as opposed to parallel compression is when we use multiple compressors in line and have an audio signal basically pass through a first compressor and then another compressor and so on and so forth, rather than being split and being compressed on this side and then mixed back together, as was the case with parallel compression. And so this could mean having multiple compressors inserted on a single track or subgroup or even the mix bus, although I don't advise over compressing your mix bus. But it could also mean, for example, if we took this kick one, we have a bit of compression happening right here on the SSL E channel strip, and then we are sending this to bus one. Bus one is also being compressed here. This is the drum subgroup. The drum subgroup is then being bused to bus 33, which is our mix bus. And if we scroll all the way over, this is being bused to the stereo out and the stereo out is being compressed once again with the Waves SSL comp. And so part of the reason why serial compression is so effective is that we get a few different instances of different compressors and they can all act differently and add their own sort of character and harmonic saturation to the signal, which we will get to shortly talking about harmonic saturation. But more importantly, we are not overloading any individual compressor to do the bulk of the gain reduction and makeup gain. And so, for example, if we were to take the synths bus, for example, just to switch things up, Let's turn off that and just solo the synths. And we were to add in a compressor. Let's just go with the stock one from Logic here. Auto gain off and just apply a little bit of compression here. And then we can copy this compressor. I'm just using stock settings here and just finessing them a little bit. Let's A-B test for loudness. So let's add a little bit of makeup gain on each of these 
So in total we have, what is it, 1.5 dB of makeup gain, 0.5 there and one right there. And then if we were to bring all of these compressors together, we could see how much gain reduction we're actually getting. So I'd say we're maxing out at about three here, three here and two here, so eight in total. And now if I was to move these over to this side, just as an example, we see a peak level of negative 12.8. Now let's, for the sake of demonstration, open up another compressor. It is the same emulation here, the digital platinum. Auto gain is off. Let's do a four to one ratio. 4.1 is it? 4.4. Same attack, release, and knee parameters and get 8 dB. So right here of compression on this synth bus now. <laughs> So you see that it's not having the chance to really return back home to zero. And before I forget, I need to add in that 1.5 dB of makeup gain here. And so we have our 8 dB of gain reduction and 1.5 dB of makeup gain. One more time. And now let's A, B, this compressor versus these three. So one compressor doing all of the work, getting again that 8 dB of gain reduction. You'll notice that it's not actually being able to get back to home very often, which is zero dB or no gain reduction. So we'll compare the sound of this and how loud it is to these three compressors in series over here. So it's not going to be the cleanest AB, but I will do my best to AB test between these two. So first off, just one compressor. <laughs> So 13 dB there. So in this case, we're getting a difference of about 3 dB in peak level, but you hear how squashed this one sounds versus how almost bolstered these three compressors in series sound. And so we're getting, again, the same amount of gain reduction and the same amount of makeup gain, but we can just apply it a lot more subtly and ultimately get louder results by using them in series rather than just a single one right here. And now if we A, B, no compression versus these three compressors in series, let's hear the difference. Negative 15.2, negative 12. It does a little bit for the loudness. I find it helps to widen it out and kind of glue those synths together. Again, we're working on a subgroup here. So the little bit of compression that we are applying here with this three compressor serial chain on the synth subgroup can help us get a little bit more loudness. And then especially if we compare it to the same amount of gain reduction to makeup gain using a single compressor right there, we can really hear the difference. And so that's how I wanted to demonstrate serial compression. Again, we can use serial compression by inserting multiple compressors, especially in modern digital audio workstations where we just have basically infinite usage of any plugins we own. Or more appropriately, I think, is by utilizing proper signal flow within the mix and just adding different stages of compression to an audio signal from its original track through to perhaps its subgroup and then into the mix bus itself. And so to reiterate, getting loudness in the mix is often an exercise in reducing the dynamic range and compression by definition compresses or reduces the dynamic range. And so I realize that I have three tips having to do with compression, but it's just a super important process to utilize in order to get louder mixes if louder mixes are what we're after. It's always important to ask yourself why you're using compression or any process for that matter, and to know that compression will suck some of the dynamic life out of a mix and may not ultimately be what we need for the mix, even if we are trying to get loudness. 
So the next tip I have for you for getting louder mixes is utilizing saturation. Now, saturation is a subtle form of distortion where we actually add harmonic content to a signal by deforming or distorting the audio waveform. These harmonics are based on the original frequency content of the signal, and because they are harmonics, they will be at integer multiples of the frequency content within the waveform. So because they are integer multiples of the frequency content that's already there, they often reside in the low mids and the upper mids. And as we discussed when looking at the equal loudness curves, we are the most sensitive to these mid-range frequencies. And so much like we can utilize EQ a little bit to boost those most sensitive frequencies in order to get a louder mix, we can also utilize saturation to produce more harmonic content in the mid-range, which will therefore increase the perceived loudness of a track or the overall mix. And so to demo this, let's have a look at something else in this mix, perhaps the clean guitars. I like using saturation on pretty much everything, but clean guitars are especially suitable, I think, because they are not distorted to begin with. I could add saturation to already distorted guitars, but they're already distorted and compressed and saturated, so the net change or net loudness gain from using saturation may not be as obvious with those guitars. And so let's just loop a short section right here. And so there's only one guitar going right here, and let's actually add in some saturation. I will go to my favorite saturator right here from FabFilter, it is the Saturn II. And let's just drive up some warm tape emulation. Bring down the output gain so that we are level matching. We have to be very careful that we aren't just increasing the level of a track. Again, we have that ceiling to deal with. Now let's have a look at just this section. peak level at negative 20.9 and then it sounds about at the same level but we do hear more mid-range right here without it so I'll bring this up by two So at that same rough peak level, we actually perceive the saturated signal as being a little bit louder, at least I do here. Again, because there is more harmonic content in the mid-range. It's just a little bit more present and therefore it will stand out and be a little bit more loud in the mix. Of course, we are just working in solo right here and I would always suggest processing whatever you are processing in the mix in the context of the mix. But I just quickly wanted to show you on something new in this mix, how saturation can be used to make things a little bit more present and then therefore a little bit louder in the mix. Again, this is going back to taking advantage of the way that we naturally hear sound and our natural sensitivities in the mid range and then adding harmonic content content in those frequencies or those frequency ranges in order to make things more present, more upfront, and dare I say, loud in the mix. Let's go over to the drums one more time. We are pretty comfortable with the drums now and loop a section over here and add some saturation on the drums now. So I will be A, being this. Let's actually turn off the compression that we have right here. And saturation itself has natural compression abilities. We're actually shaping the tops and the bottoms of the waveform. So in a way, we are compressing the waveform a little bit. We just don't have the same attack and release controls, but we are still shaping particularly the peaks of the audio signal itself. And so we get a little bit of a compression-like effect where we are actually reducing the dynamic range. And then we also have the added benefit of adding harmonic content to the signal. And so let's set up this Saturn II so that we are A-Bing and having the same perceived loudness. And then we can have a look closer at what the actual peak levels are saying here. So. That's quite a bit of grit. It's 
quite a bit lower in level. You can hear it especially on the kick. Kick sounds louder. So the snare sounds a little bit louder when the saturation is off, but the kick sounds louder when the saturation is on. And so that ties into what I was saying earlier about the low end information or the low end frequencies needing more energy to be heard in the mix. If we can actually add harmonic content based off of those frequencies in the low mids, then we can actually make the elements, in this case the kick drum, stand out more in the mix as a result. And so this isn't perfect, but let's have a quick look at the peak level resulting from saturation and then without saturation. So with saturation. We have negative 20 and then relatively the same perceived loudness without saturation. Quite a significant jump. Even if I brought this up to zero dB, we have negative 15.2 and it sounds louder than the negative six point something when I don't have any saturation. So it's really amazing. Once I found out that saturation could do this and really increase the amount of headroom I could get in the mix, I had a complete field trip and I was using saturation, overusing saturation on everything in my mixes. And I still to this day love using saturation and distortion, not only as effects, but also as a mixing tool to help get louder results out of my music production. So moving on to tip number seven, we have everybody's favorite way of bringing more loudness to the mix, and that is limiting. And so let's go over to the stereo out and have a look at the limiter. Once again, I'm using the Pro L2. Here's what the mix sounds like without it. And here's what the mix sounds like with it. And so what limiting is, it's effectively a hard compressor that doesn't allow any signal past a certain threshold. A compressor will have a ratio as I was showing you earlier. And so the ratio of a compressor effectively tells us the ratio of what will be outputted versus what will be inputted above the set threshold of the compressor. So let's say the threshold is set at negative 10 dBFS, and we have a ratio of 10 to one. For every 10 dB, the signal into the compressor will be above that negative 10 dBFS. Only one dB will be outputted above that negative 10 dBFS. And so if we are driving a zero dBFS signal into this compressor, in this example, the compressor will output negative nine dBFS. And so with a brick wall limiter like the Pro L2 by FabFilter, we effectively have a ratio of infinity to one. So whatever the threshold is set at, nothing's supposed to go above that. Now, of course, we still have attack and release controls, so there is some time variables to take into account. And we may also get intersample peaking, so we may actually go above that threshold. But in theory, a brick wall limiter will not allow any signal to output past that set threshold. In this case, I have oversampling turned up to 16x, and so there really shouldn't be any intersample peaks being outputted by this. You see that my output is at negative 0.1 dB, and the gain right here is I'm adding gain to the input signal, pushing it to a point where it will reach that ceiling, and then the limiter won't allow it to go past that ceiling. And so the timeline right here will actually show me how hard this limiter is working. So if I play this back and talk over it, these red peaks right here that are coming down is how much the limiter is actually subtracting from the signal. So these red peaks are where the input signal would go above the set threshold threshold and then the limiter is saying no you can't go past that and I'm actually going to reduce the level like a compressor would all in a way to get more loudness out of the mix and particularly in loudness maximization when mastering hard brick wall limiting is often the last thing in the signal chain. 
but we don't only need to use limiting on the mix bus or the master bus. We can actually utilize it on our subgroups and even on individual tracks themselves. And so to demo this, let's go back to our trusty drum subgroup right here. And you can see that I already had the L1 limiter. This is one from Waves. It's quite a bit simpler than the Fab Filter Pro L2. You can see here we have the threshold set. So I have that set at negative 19.5, the output ceiling, and then the release control. I just have that set at one, although I could also choose auto as well. And so if we play back the drums right here, I will solo them. We can see how much is happening to the drums being passed through this limiter. Let me turn off the Saturn 2 so that we have a nice sound out of the drums here. So I'm getting quite a bit of attenuation here. And much like compression, it kind of helps to tie things together, to glue things together, if you will. It's hitting the kick and the snare awfully hard. Let's have another listen here. Without. And so it's hitting it pretty hard. It's kind of dulling the transients a little bit. But if we have a look at the peak levels without the limiter. Negative 6.7 and then with the limiter. Negative 17.5. So we're getting over 10 dB more headroom just by using some limiting right here. I wouldn't actually go through and attenuate that much with the limiter. I believe I was using some clipping and of course some bus compression before going into the limiter in the actual mix. And that's an important point that I should reiterate here. All of these tips can be used together much like they all tie together in the overall concepts of how to get louder mixes. And so I would suggest combining all of the tips I'm sharing with you and not only relying on one of them to get you louder mixes. So if, for example, I was to turn on the SSL comp and then perhaps the Saturn 2. You see I'm barely attenuating now. So in this case, the limiter is not working nearly as hard and it's not sucking the life out of the transients right here. I actually have some more serial style compression, if you will. There's a bit of compression happening right here on the SSL comp. There's also a little bit of compression along with the harmonic saturation happening here on the Saturn II. And then there is some hard compression happening right here. Essentially compression with an infinity to one ratio with the limiter right here. And so again, it's all tying together I hope that you see how holistic we need to treat mixing and getting loudness out of the mix is no different. And we can see one more plugin that I haven't touched here yet on the drums. And I will close this video out once again, focusing on the drums because they are nice and transient. And a lot of getting loudness out of our mixes is actually dealing with transients. And that is clipping. Now clipping is often taught to new budding audio engineers as the boogeyman. We want to avoid digital clipping at all costs, but it's actually a super useful effect and a super useful process, particularly when we're using softer modes of clipping and we shouldn't shy away from it just because digital clipping is so bad. I even use digital clipping and professional mastering engineers often clip their converters in order to get a bit more loudness. So I do have a video on the differences between clipping and brick wall limiting. I'll leave a link to that in the description box down below. But essentially what clipping does is it shaves off the top of a waveform. And so if a input signal goes above the set limit that the clipper has, rather than acting like a limiter and quickly reducing the level of the output, a clipper plugin or clipping more generally will just cut off the waveform right there and smooth it out. Now with the digital clipping, the clipping will shave off the top of the waveform perfectly and will be flattened out. This can often lead to rather harsh distortion and even some aliasing and other artifacts in the signal. And that's why it's kind of taught as a boogeyman. But some hard clipping and definitely analog style soft clipping rounds out the audio rather than shaving it off completely. And while it does create some distortion, it can definitely act to get us more headroom and therefore more potential loudness in the mix. And so the beautiful thing I think about clipping, particularly transient signals, is that by shaving off the very peak level, we don't actually alter the perceived loudness of that transient all that much. And in many cases, especially if there's not a whole lot of low end, long waveform energy, we often don't get all that much noticeable distortion out of it. There will be distortion and there will be more distortion the more you shave off, but we can often get away with very subtle, almost imperceptible distortion using proper clipping. 
And so let's demonstrate that with the drum bus once again. This is the standard clip by Sir Audio Tools. It's my go-to clipping plugin. So let's have a listen to what this is doing to the drums here. You can hear that distortion on the kick. Because the kick has a lot of low energy, it will distort before the snare. So it's not really distorting the snare there, it is distorting the kick, but it actually adds a little bit of character that I don't mind on the kick. And we hear there that we aren't losing any perceptible level when we turn the standard clip on or off, once again. If anything, it sounds a little bit louder and a little bit more separated when the standard clip is off. And now the brilliant part, if we reset this peak level meter right here and have a listen without the standard clip. Negative 6.7 and with the standard clip. We just saved ourselves about 5 dB without a significant amount of distortion, which to me is a huge win in terms of getting more loudness out of our mix. And that is why clipping is such a valuable asset to have and a valuable tool to use in our mixing if we want louder mixes. So that's all I've got for you inside of Logic Pro today. All right, I hope that these techniques for loudness have proved insightful and helpful for you. If you'd like to learn more about mixing, I do have my free mixing guidebook. It will be the first link in the description box down below. I go through my entire framework for mixing from start to finish to help you make the right decisions at the right times to help improve your mixes. Again, it is the first link in the description box down below. You can sign up to my newsletter and I'll send it to you right away. If you'd like to hang out with me more here on YouTube, I do have another few videos in the top left and right corner for you to check out. I would also invite you to subscribe to the channel if you'd like more information from me on mixing and music production. I'd like to give a shout out to everybody who's already subscribed once again, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.